All right, good evening, everyone. This is chapter 16 of the Psychology Second Edition uh, textbook. Uh, and chapter 16 is all about therapy and treatment. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and start talking about that right now. So, um, you know, there are lots of forms of therapy, lots of forms of treatment, um, and they're designed to uh, address an array of problems. Here you see a picture. This is actually a, a picture of um, what they call ocean therapy um, at Kent Pendleton. And um, it includes surfing and group discussions. Uh, and it's designed to uh, assist those veterans that um, are returning and, and have um, symptoms of post-traumatic stress, right? So this is, um, uh, this, is, it, this is a picture, an example of it. You know, there's uh, other um, therapies too. I know um, when I was at uh, VVSD working with um, veterans there, uh, we also had them go to uh, 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 like, uh, in a, uh, you know, the horse therapy. I'm trying to think of what, um, uh, I can't think of the official name of it. Anyway, but, but, it, um, but really working with um, horses and, um, then there was some music therapy. There's lots of different ways to engage um, individuals looking for, um, looking for assistance. Um, so thank you. And I was just checking the, checking the chat and very nice. So somebody is sharing that, um, that their son attended um, uh, therapy with the horses. That's awesome. And, um, and then someone complimented me. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, 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 like, I like this class too, so thank you very much. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots, of, lots of different therapies and we're, and we're gonna be talking. Now tonight, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to go in depth into each one. It's, it's really gonna be kind of like a summary. I'm gonna be going through, um, uh, some of these, and um, uh, there's a couple of videos that I'm going to show. Uh, there's also a couple of videos that I had posted that I also planned on showing tonight too that um, are no longer available. That happens to me every once in a while. Um, I did not have time to vet any other uh, videos, but it, it's okay. The lecture will cover what you need. Um, I just like to do videos because sometimes people learn uh, that way. Um, as well as part of their learning process. Plus it kind of breaks up the monotony of you listening to my voice all night long. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, all right. So tonight let's first talk about um, uh, treatment in the past. We're gonna talk about asylums and, and some um, people that uh, were instrumental in, in, in helping out with, um, some things in the past. And we'll, we'll talk about what I mean by that in a moment. The asylums were not, not great places, right? And uh, there's a couple of historical figures that kind of called attention to that and made changes. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, I briefly talked about this on uh, Monday night when we were in chapter 15, when we were talking about how in the past, they, they uh, uh, people in the past used to view uh, individuals that were experiencing symptoms of uh, mental illnesses, right? Um, they believed that they would be possessed or, uh, you know, um, or that they were witches or it was some kind of uh, black magic um, or demonic possession, right? So, um, so one of the ways that they tried to treat this in the past um, was uh, one, exorcism, uh, which I, everyone is probably familiar with. And, and then um, trephining, which is they literally would drill a hole in the skull to release the um, evil spirits from, from, the, from the body. Uh, and what's unfortunate is, is that uh, this often led to the individual's death. Um, and then of course, um, execution or imprisonment of um, individuals who were experiencing um, uh, symptoms of, of mental illness um, 
also occurred, right? Burning at, at the stake uh, if, if they were accused of witchcraft, excuse me, things like that. So as you can see, the past was not a very friendly place for individuals that, you know, maybe hearing voices or experiencing mania or um, having uh, delusions, right? So, <clears throat> so by the 18th century, uh, you know, people that were exhibiting unusual uh, behavior, um, they decided to institutionalize them. And um, so asylums were the first institutions that were created for the specific purpose of housing people with psychological disorders. And the issue here was it was really focused on, uh, you know, really removing them from society. Really was not about treatment. It was, um, it was, it was just about taking them out of society, kind of ostracizing them, putting them away, and, uh, you know, and they were often kept in really horrible conditions, right? Being changed to, the, changed to their beds, uh, no contact or little contact with caregivers. Um, you know, just really, really awful uh, conditions. So then the French physician, uh, Philippe uh, Pinel uh, came along and he argued for the more humane treatment of individuals experiencing symptoms of mental illness. And um, he suggested that they should be talked to, un, you know, that they shouldn't be chained up, shouldn't be you know, locked away in these dark, you know, windowless rooms. And um, you know, he was really, uh, the one to, to really start this. Um, and this started in uh, Paris. He was French, like I said. Um, so in 1795, that's when a lot of this was um, being implemented. And uh, the result was, is that a lot of patients actually benefited from having uh, the, them being talked to, not being chained up, not being isolated. Because uh, here's what we know today. You isolate an individual who is experiencing symptoms of mental illness, and what happens? It gets worse. It doesn't get better. Um, isolating human beings is, um, uh, well, it's, it, it, it's downright cruel, right? And, and it can really exacerbate um, a person's um, mental illness. Um, even if they were only mildly, you know, had, experiencing mild symptoms, it can really make it so that it makes it much, much worse. So by making these changes, you know, patients actually benefited and they were able to be released from the hospital, which really is that not our goal, right? At least that's how I look at it today. Our goal is for, um, uh, regardless of the symptoms, whatever the individual is experiencing, it, whether it be auditory hallucinations, you know, um, substance use disorder, you know, that is, that is considered a form of, um, well, it's in the DSM-5, so it's, it's a diagnosable mental health disorder, right? Um, and, you know, uh, in the last chapter we talked about, one of the myths is that, um, you know, sometimes people don't think recovery is possible, and that's Absolutely not true. Recovery is possible, but it, it depends on what the interventions are. And then there was Dorothea Dix. Uh, she was a social reformer and um, and an advocate for uh, the indigent insane and you know indigent, you know homeless, not having nowhere to go. Um, and she was really. Um, she was really an advocate for this, right? She discovered underfunded, underregulated system. Um, it perpetuated abuse of those experiencing mental illness, um, which again, just exacerbates their symptoms, right? Makes it worse for them. And she was actually instrumental in creating the first American mental asylum um, by relentlessly lobbying the state legislatures and Congress to set up and fund such institutions. So she was trying to get 
um, things going to where people would have um, uh, uh, you know, place to go to be able to get help and, and that was funded. Uh, let's see. Ty says, Hotel California slang from the band The Eagles. I do remember that song. Um, yeah, next door to Chino is an example of the silence, right? Hospitals for the uh, for those experiencing mental illness. Yep. Uh, today, um, which is actually CRC. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, being that you work for drug court, you you probably a lot of people will. It used to be the civil commit that a lot of people from drug court would yeah. get sent there, yeah. including myself. So I know firsthand. <laughs> yes. 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 And thank you for sharing that. Um, oh, hold on a second. I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, that's where I was going. And so today, you know, we have like, uh, and I used to work at the uh, San Diego uh, Psychiatric Hospital down on Rosecrans, you know, um, and, and there are other places around town where um, uh, people can be humanely housed and taken care of and provided services. You know, and, and this is this is the direction that we want to go in. Um, there are lots of holes in the system. It's not perfect, that's for sure. Um, but it is, uh, you know, but when compared to the asylums of old, um, yeah, it's all it's a lot better. All right, let's see. Um, so in the past, right, American asylums were usually filthy offered little treatment um, and people would be institutionalized for decades uh, and, and against their own will. You know, today when I, I'll give you an example. So when I worked at the psychiatric hospital, you know, for people to be committed, that this actually has to go before a judge um, and, um, you know, for longer commitments, right? So a person can be put on a 72 hour hold and then that can be extended. Um, I forget all the laws now. It's been so long since I've had to work in it. Uh, 5150 is three days. 5152, I think, is seven to 10 days. And, and anyway, and then it goes up to 14. And, and, but anything really longer than that, that has to be presented before a judge. And, and a judge would come to the, um, to the hospital to review uh, a patient's case. Um, you know, because to take someone's freedom away, uh, you know, that is really a huge, big deal. Um, so there has to be some evidence that the individual really is gravely disabled. In other words, they are completely unable to take care of themselves and therefore, um, you know, um, uh, uh, committing them is, is reasonable for their own health, well-being, and safety, right? But some of the reasons why that's come along is because in the past, people would be institutionalized for decades. Put them in there, throw away the key. Nobody's reviewing it. Are they getting better? Maybe, maybe not, right? So imagine um, imagine happening that to you or, or to someone you love. Um, some of the treatment things that they did, right? Like submerging people in, in cold baths for long periods of time, um, electroshock. Um, today it's called electroconvulsive therapy and actually uh, it is still used um, for some things, for instance, for depression, uh, for severe depression that is not, that doesn't really respond to other, other um, treatments, um, electroconvulsive therapy or also known as ECT and we'll, probably, and we'll see that later on in another slide, can still be used today um, I'm not sure how often it's used, um, but it does still, still, uh, it is still used. Um, anyway, these conditions, like from the 19th century all the way through, you know, um, the 20th century, um, you know, they existed here. So, um, then in the 1950s, 1954, antipsychotic ma medications were introduced. Um, and what, you know, and, and 
the advent of some medications uh, has really gone a long way in helping in, in helping people um, achieve recovery. Um, and this was the beginning. Um, the antipsychotic medications, which you know reduces symptoms of psychosis, right? Auditory hallucinations um, and uh, uh, visual hallucinations and, and things like that um, and delusions. Right, they were successful in, in, in reducing these symptoms. And when a person can have their symptoms reduced, they're more able to function in society. Uh, 1975, there was the uh, Mental Retardation Facilities and Community Mental Health Centers Construction Act. And what this did was this provided federal funding um, for building community mental health centers. And um, and this was also the process that started uh, deinstitutionalization. So in other words, asylums were being shut down, big institutions were really, um, were really you know, going away at this point. And so like for instance, in, in, here in San Diego County, they have you know, the uh, San Diego County Mental Health, right? And then there's different regions where, uh, depending on where a person lives and, things like that, that they can begin to uh, access community mental health in, in these localized areas. And then, <clears throat> and I started to say this anyway, deinstitutionalization, right? That's really, we're closing those large um, uh, asylums. What's unfortunate here though, is there's a couple of things, it's unfortunate. Whereas the idea around deinstitutionalization is a great idea especially the way people were being treated and the, you know, and the history around asylums. But the system itself was not set up uh, that effectively. And I think it was in the last slide or the slide before, I forget where I was talking about this. I kind of mentioned gaps in the system, didn't I? And, um, and so sometimes, you know, there's not always the services that are available um, or the funding that's available um, necessary for some of these services. Uh, last class, we talked about, because um, here in San Diego, we have a very large homeless population. Um, and part of that is really weather, um, honestly. Uh, and, um, you know, we get uh, what they call that homeless migration. But the other part of that is, is, uh, many, many of these individuals are experiencing symptoms of mental illness and have been for a long time. Um, and so with these gaps in the system, it wasn't set up that effectively. Uh, it led to an increase in homelessness, which we still are really seeing and experiencing today. Now here in San Diego County, um, they, you know, there's the, the housing first, um, uh, projects that we're doing, you know, where we're trying to get people, okay, let's get you into housing, and then we can focus on your, um, um, on reducing your symptoms, on your substance use disorder, and, and all the other services that you might need. Um, so that's, that's part of a, a, a solution there. But even with that, are there enough beds? I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, my bet is, is, is that the system is still pretty overwhelmed. I know that when I'm working, I'll give you an example. When I'm, when I'm working with uh, trying to get uh, beds for uh, females that have a substance use disorder, co-occurring disorder, there's a whole lot less beds for women than there are for men. So that's another example of a, of a gap in our system. Um, let's see. Yeah, so somebody has a, a comment that deinstitutionalization was the beginning of the prison increase. Yes, I will agree with that. Um, uh, being homeless, suffering from mental illness, uh, it, 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 it kind of did become de facto criminalized in, in many ways. Same thing with substance use disorders, right? Uh, instead of treating um, substance use disorders and, and um, symptoms of, of mental health disorders, 
um, as a medical thing, you're right. Oftentimes, you know, they run into law enforcement um, and why? Because they're trespassing or they're shoplifting or there's something else going on, um, but they don't get the help that they need or they're just illegal lodging. This, you know, just camping um, is enough that might get somebody, you know, um, arrested and then put into the system that way, yes. Um, all right. Um, so I kind of talked about this already. Asylums have since been replaced with psychiatric hospitals and local community hospitals. Um, and I kind of gave a couple of examples in my experience working at, at the San Diego um, Psychiatric Hospital in, on Rosecrans. Um, and there's also couple of ways people get there, right? There's involuntary treatment. Um, and this occurs when, you know, therapy is not the individual's choice. Um, so some examples of that perfect example is, is where I'm currently working now, right? All of my clients are on probation. Um, they get accepted into drug court. Um, it's a minimum of 18 months. Uh, it may include uh, residential treatment, and then they come to intensive outpatient, followed by outpatient, you know, step down to outpatient. And then once they complete that, um, that's considered the completion of treatment, but they're still required to do what's called recovery services or what people, um, if, if anyone in here has been around for a while, uh, recovery services is the new way of saying aftercare, right? So in other words, it's still providing services, but just not as frequent. Um, you know, like our, our clients may come once a week for a group and once a week for an individual session, for example, as opposed to intensive outpatient where they're coming to us nine to 10 hours a week for group, one to two hours a week for individual sessions, right? So you can see it steps down. Um, now, the reason why I'm kind of talking about that with involuntary treatment is technically it's voluntary. They don't have to participate in the drug court program, for example. Um, but the other side of that argument is, well, if their choice is come to drug court or go to jail, you know, there is sort of a form of coercion happening there. And so we kind of have to keep that in mind when we're working with our clients. And, you know, maybe they are considering it involuntary. Yeah, I, I signed on the line, but uh, I really didn't have a choice, right? So they might look at it as that. Whereas, of course, voluntary treatment, I think everyone understands that. I realize I have a problem and I'm going to go get some help for it, right? I'm, I'm choosing to attend uh, therapy for, to relieve whatever symptoms I'm going through, depression, anxiety, substance use, what, whatever the um, uh, case may be. Um, and then, you know, different treatment providers, right? We have psychologists, psychiatrists clinical social workers, marriage and family therapists. I will also add on here, um, it's not on the slide, but you know, substance use counselors, um, licensed professional clinical counselors, um, uh, and, you know, and the like. School counselors uh, also in, included in that. This is what, um, uh, you know, and they can get these at the community mental health uh, centers, private, you know, um, private places, like if you have Kaiser insurance, you might be going to Kaiser or, for example. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. Any questions so far? Any questions on the history, asylums, deinstitutionalization? Also involuntary treatment too. I kind of talked about briefly when I was like talking about 5150, right? Which is, you know, a 72 hour hold. Um, yeah, so, all right. All right, so now we're gonna talk about different types of treatment. Um, and, you know, the first thing we're gonna talk about is there's, there's psychotherapy, right? Um, um, psychotherapy is any psychological treatment that invo involves um, lots of different methods to uh, 
help someone to overcome, you know, their personal problems, attain personal growth, meet whatever goals that they're, they're looking for. Um, and this comes in the form of talk therapy, narrative therapy, um, you know, they can be doing groups or individuals, uh, things like that. And then biomedical therapy that involves medication or medical procedures uh, to treat psychological disorders. So for example, a medical procedure um, that I might reference right now would be, you know, uh, electroconvulsive therapy for depression that isn't being su successfully treated by anything else, right? Um, could include uh, medications such as, you know, an antidepressant, SSRI, uh, mood stabilizer, an antipsychotic. It could also include medically assisted treatment, MAT, which is um, in the uh, addiction treatment uh, field, right? MAT is like your methadone, your suboxone, your Vivitrol, your sublocate. You know, these are medications that are designed to assist the um, individuals with, uh, the ones I was really talking about is opioid use disorders um, and um, alcohol use disorders. Vivitrol works really well with, with uh, AUDs as well. Um, and so, but here's, here's what I always say about this and um, uh, the, and, and the book also talks about this, you know, it's most often used in combination with psychotherapy. And I think, uh, and this is a very important thing to consider. Um, I talked to several of my clients. Uh, I mean, I have this conversation a, a lot um, and I've had a lot over the years. You know, if, you, if a client is experiencing depression um, and as a result of the depression, they develop certain cognitive disorder, uh, not cognitive distortion, distortions is what I'm trying to say. Unhelpful thinking styles is really what I'm trying to say. Let me say it in simpler terms. Um, you know, they develop ways of thinking. They develop um, behavioral habits. Um, they may have acquired, you know, some um, level of learned helplessness, right? So taking an SSRI might help stabilize them and relieve some of the symptoms of the depression, but medication alone isn't gonna address someone's thinking style. Medication alone is not going to address um, someone's behavioral habits or, or their um, lack of self-efficacy because they've developed learned helplessness over time um, or certain belief systems. And this is where psychotherapy comes in. So the medication helps people stabilize while psychotherapy also helps them develop new coping skills and to work through some things, right? And so best used in, in combination. I, you know, sometimes the, the myth is, is all I gotta do, and, and in America, this, this, we, love our, we love our fast food medicine. That's kind of like what I call it, right? Pop a pill and I'll be okay, right? Um, it, it's not as simple as that, right? Um, so I always encourage people, you know, do, if you need the medication, do the medication, but also do psychotherapy. Um, and it's patient's choice on whether or not they do medication or not. Some people do not want to. Um, <clears throat> so, and we have to kind of like look at, look at that as well. Um, let's see here. So we're gonna watch a quick video on, on, on choosing um, a psychologist. I think this lasts about three minutes. And, um, you know, and, and, and your choice of a psychologist or a therapist is, is important as well. Um, so, and we'll talk more about, about those interactions. Some people come into therapy just feeling like something's wrong and they're not sure what it is. But I think some people really know they've been struggling with anxiety or they have a relationship that's not going well. And so I think if you have some clarity about what it is you're seeking help for, that can help you look for someone who specializes in those issues. 
Sometimes there are particular cultural factors which are really important when someone's looking for a therapist. Uh, they may want to see someone of a particular ethnicity or even if they're not a member of a particular subgroup, have expertise in working with certain subgroups. So for example, um, around spirituality or uh, substance abuse or recovery or um, maybe working with gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender clients. a lot of clients don't realize that it's okay for them to interview us and that it's appropriate for them maybe even to develop a list of questions that they want to ask a psychologist on the phone before they even schedule an appointment. And they may want to ask about their experience working with a particular issue. They may want to ask about their experience working with a particular community. You can ask somebody how many clients they've treated with this particular struggle. I think it's hard for clients to ask these questions because they feel so vulnerable, but they really have a right to interview us and find out who they'd be coming in and, and paying money to see to get help on something. A number of psychologists do take insurance and usually people need to get a list from their provider of the people who are covered and look through that list. You know, sometimes I get calls from people who want to know if I'm on a particular panel, and if I'm not, I'm willing to take a look at the people on that list and see if I can recommend somebody so it's not such a blind uh, you know, effort to find somebody. But many insurance companies will pay for out-of-network providers. Do you feel safe with this person? Do you trust them? Do you feel that they understand you? Uh, do you? And even do you think that they like you? You know, that's actually, research has shown that that's a really important factor in treatment outcomes, is whether or not the client feels that the therapist likes them. But I think liking the person who you're coming to and bringing your most vulnerable concerns is one of the most important pieces of good fit. It's not just about expertise and experience, but do you feel safe going to this person and opening yourself up every week? All right, and so actually she talked about a couple of things that I kind of want to um, uh, hit on, but first, are there any questions about uh, kind of like what we've talked about up to this point or, or anything that she talked about in the video? Any questions or comments? All right. One of the things that I definitely want to highlight is um, what she said about um, uh, it's absolutely you're right. You can interview the the potential therapist or the psychologist that you are going to see. What is their experience with uh, particular uh, issues or a particular community? Um, because there are a lot of cultural uh, considerations to take to take into account. Um, I know one of the things one of the things that I constantly have to do every year to renew my licenses, and 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 that's plural. I have three, um, and I have to do so many um, continuing education units. Um, you know, uh, you know, as a therapist, I'm required, and and as a, a uh, as an AOD counselor. I'm required to, um, uh, to continue my education. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's focused around ethics. It's focused around cultural competency, which is really, really important. Um, and that's sort of what she was talking about there, um, which is you know, very important, cultural competence um, and, and experience in whatever particular area. Um, just because someone has, um, I'll give you an example. So I have a master's degree, you know, um, I'm, I, I can do therapy, um, but if somebody came to me, for instance, with an eating disorder, uh, is it within my scope of practice according to my license and according to my education? Uh, well, yeah, but I don't have experience in treating eating disorders. And the thing about eating disorders, and I'm using this as an example is, um, because it's a good one for me, 
um, I would definitely be referring that individual out to someone who has an expertise in um, eating disorders. Now, with my um, APCC uh, license here in California, which soon will be actually fully licensed, an LPCC, um, I have an expertise in substance use disorders, right? And that's why I maintain my AOD credentials. So I add that on there. Not everyone has an expertise in substance use disorders. Uh, so, so I'm just not saying that they can't treat it. I'm just saying, you know, it's okay to interview to see what kind of experience a person that you're going to has. And really, if they're ethical, they're going to tell you. And if they can't do it, they're going to refer you to someone who can, right? So all of that is, um, you know, all of that can happen. It, it can be difficult to find a, a therapist sometimes, right? You might have to call a couple of people. Um, do they take your insurance? So, and that can be part of the struggle too. So if, um, if you or a family member needs that, um, uh, you know, don't give up at the, you know, at the first person that says, you know, no, I'm not taking any new clients or, you know, I don't have an appointment or no, I don't, you know, I don't treat that, right? Um, keep trying. The other thing I kind of want to point out where she talked about best fit, which is really important. I will tell you, there's a whole lot of research out there that says, and that supports uh, what I'm about to say. And here's what I'm about to say when it comes to fit. You have a client in, that has a really good rapport with a therapist or a counselor. What, it, what studies have shown is that it really doesn't matter the interventions that are used um, as long as that rapport is really, really good. That, it, studies have shown that rapport is a very good indicator on, on a person's progress. So you might come to me and I, I do CBT work, right? Um, which is very evidence-based for substance use disorders, right? So I know it's, it, it's evidence-based, but it's also my rapport. If I have a poor rapport, you know, a poor rapport, if I have a bad rapport with an individual, um, I could be using all the best evidence-based practices and probably not get anywhere because the client doesn't feel safe with me. So it's really important that the client feels safe with the individual that they're with um, for that growth to happen. So, all right, I think I've preached enough. I apologize. Um, any other questions or comments? All right, so let's talk about the different types of psychotherapy. And the first one we're gonna talk about, actually we have hit on Sigmund Freud probably what, three or four times this semester. He was introduced to you in, in chapter one. We've talked about him in the development chapter. You know, we, we've talked about him um, in the personality chapter. And now we're talking about him in the uh, treatment and therapy uh, chapter. Now, Sigmund Freud was um, the individual who really kind of developed psychotherapy. You know, if you imagine, uh, let me see if I have the picture. So. You, you know, picture the couch, right? The very famous couch, you lie on your back um, and, you know, Freud with his, um, with his clipboard and his pen taking notes, right? Um, that's how most people, you know, imagine it because that was how it started. Um, today, we don't really, I don't have a couch in my office, right? Uh, we usually kind of squared off with, with the client, there's some kind of interaction, right? Um, let me go back here. Um, but he used different techniques. So one of his techniques was free association, right? So he would have the, uh, the patient relax and then whatever came to his mind, let's just talk about it. Um, and so his idea was, is that the ego would try to block unacceptable urges or conflicts during free association and that the, as a result of that, the patient would demonstrate resistance. Um, and then he would analyze the resistance. Um, 
The other thing he liked to do was dream analysis. And this is where, you know, he would interpret the underlying meaning of dreams. Um, now, the next item on here on this slide is transference. Um, actually, I still kind of use this today. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny. I was discussing, you know, um, a case today where, you know, a, a client seems to be experiencing some transference um, with one of the counselors, right? And, and transference is where a patient or a client transfers either, it, it could be positive emotions, right? Like uh, I, I remind somebody of their, of their brother. Actually, I've had client, a particular client tell me, oh, you remind me so much of my uncle and he's so smart, right? So that's, that's evidence that the client is experiencing transference with me. He's, he is um, uh, transferring positive emotions that's associated with his uncle onto me, right? Um, or transference can be negative, right? So um, if somebody, if, if I remind somebody, I'll tell you what I get all the time. Um, oh, you look like a cop or a PO. <laughs> so right there, there could be some automatic built-in negative transference right there, right? So I'm working, uh, I go in to screen a client, for instance, for drug court, I go into the jail, um, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I just look like I look, right? Most everybody asks, are you a cop? And, um, um, but right there already, they're gonna associate negative emotions based on their relationships with cops in the past or uh, PO officers in the past and project that onto me, right? So that's, that's transference. Um, What's not listed here, and I'm gonna kind of talk about it because I don't think it's on any of my slides, but I like to talk about it, especially, and I talk about it in my AODS classes. There's also the idea, uh, there's counter transference. And that is where the counselor or the therapist uh, is transferring positive or negative emotions um, on their client. Um, and counter transference, um, it's natural, it happens, um, but it's up to the therapist or the counselor to actually manage that because that can not, that can be an unhelpful situation for, uh, for that relationship. But transference, uh, Freud used to like to use transference to, to explore where the, the client was at. Um, we can still do that today, right? Exploring that, that transference. Where is this, where is this coming from? Now, Today, psycho, you can find psychoanalysts today. You can, they're still out there. Um, it's not as, there are not as many around, but you can, still, you can still find them. And the thing about psychotherapy or psycho, I'm sorry, psychoanalysis, I misspoke, psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is not a quick process. A person can be in psychoanalysis for years years and years and years. Um, so it is not brief intervention. Um, so, uh, so people can spend a lot of money doing this. And then there's psychodynamic um, psychotherapy, which is talk therapy belief uh, based on the belief of the unconscious um, and that childhood um, conflicts impact their, their adult behavior, right? So that also kind of harkens back to um, uh, Freud's psychosexual stages, right? So people are, um, you know, don't resolve certain um, conflicts in the past, and then in their childhood, in their developmental stages, then it shows up in their uh, adulthood. All right, so this is also, um, I, I, I put this in red because I did not have time to vet another video. Um, this video is also posted on um, Canvas, but you are going to find that it has since been, been discontinued. So I have to find another video. So you guys don't have to worry about, uh, about, this, about this video for the exam. Um, everything we've been talking about or what you've read in the book is what you'll be tested on. So since this video is no longer available. 
Then there's play therapy. Um, now, play therapy is a type of psychoanalytical therapy um, that uses, you know, toys mainly. Um, you can use a sandbox. It can use different things, but um, but usually um, uses toys instead of talking, and mainly used in child therapy. And so the techniques are, so you give them toys or dolls, stuffed animals. Um, you give them figurines in a sandbox, and it's basically used to help the children to uh, explore where they're at based on how they're interacting with these items. Um, and so that's what the therapist is, is doing. They're observing, observing the child um, and how they're interacting. Um, so there's two different types of play therapy, right? There's non-directive. And in non-directive, the kids are just left to work out through the problems by playing freely with, with the items, right? And then the therapist is just observing um, what is happening. And then directive uh, play therapy, the therapist will provide some sort of structure or guidance, maybe by suggesting topics, um, asking questions. Oh, what is this talk? You know, why is this doll hitting that doll or whatever the case may be, right? So they may ask questions. They may play with the child. Um, you know, they may do designs in the sandbox with, with the child um, and, and, and help them uh, therapeutically in that way. It provides a really safe environment, um, uh, you know, for children. And, and remember because two, depending on what age they are as well, you know, some of their cognitive abilities, um, you know, may not work well with like traditional narrative um, psychotherapy, for instance. And then there's behavior therapy. And here we are, here we are talking about classical conditioning again. Um, so this is why in chapter six, the learning um, chapter was so important. A lot, of, a lot of stuff that we do is about learning or unlearning, right? So you guys uh, may see some questions on the exam regarding classical conditioning, right? Um, so conditioning principles that are applied to recondition clients and change their behavior. So uh, I know I've used this example before in previous lectures. I'm gonna use it again now uh, when we're talking about triggers and trigger extinction. Um, uh, that is a form, that is using um, classical conditioning. So a trigger is actually a learned association um, between one thing and another. For instance, you know, fishing and drug use or drinking, um, you know, hanging out with in a certain area of town or going to a certain place. Um, you know, that's associated with substance use. So just driving by there or thinking about it could trigger a, a, a response. <clears throat> There's a couple of different ways that we, that we can use classical conditioning. Um, one is counter conditioning. And that's where the client learns a new response to a stimuli that was previously elicited as an undesirable behavior. So this can include adversive conditioning and exposure therapy. So adversive conditioning is where you pair a, a, an unpleasant stimulus to stop its undesirable behavior. Um, this, is, this has been used with like, for instance, addiction. So, and for example, I'll give you an example of adversive uh, therapy so, um, or conditioning. So you have somebody that's biting their nails, and this is a very simple, um, simple example, but it's just to illustrate it. Somebody wants to stop biting their nails. They hate that habit, right? But they're, they're, but they're not, they, they just can't stop doing it. Putting something bitter or acrid on their fingertips, right? So now every time they go to bite their fingernails, they get a very unpleasant taste. 
So that would be an example of, of adversive conditioning. Um, so it's unpleasant to do it. So every time I do it, I'm, I'm gonna stop doing it. And eventually you break that habit. In alcohol use disorder um, and, and, and adversive medication that has been used in the past is um, medication known as antabuse. So a person that's taking antabuse, um, if they consume alcohol, it causes them to become ill, right? They have side effects like vomiting. Um, and it just, it makes them feel awful. So, uh, so by taking the antabuse, if they, if they consume alcohol, they have that adverse reaction, they're not gonna want to take the alcohol anymore. And so a person can take, you know, antabuse for a while um, uh, in order to kind of help treat that alcoholism. The thing about antabuse too is, even once you start stop taking it, I think it remains kind of in the system at a at enough of a therapeutic dose for about seven days. So even after you stop taking the medication, if you consume alcohol within that time period, you can still have these negative side effects. Um, but then after that, it kind of wears off. And then the other type of therapy is exposure therapy. And what that does is that seeks to change the response to a condition stimulus. So um, I briefly talked about it in the last chapter um, and I'll hit on it again here. This is used mainly to treat um, anxiety and fears. So thinking about um, uh, Watson and the uh, little Albert experiment, right? So they, they induced a fear response, a conditioned fear response with you know, the little white mouse. Um, in order to, to, uh, to undo that, they would have to engage in exposure therapy, right? Um, where the client would be repeatedly exposed, little Albert, to the, um, to the little white mouse. And with the idea that eventually he's gonna get used to it again, right? Um, so on the next slide, I think we have a spider. If, I, if my memory is correct. Oh, no, it's coming up. Oops, hold on, technical difficulty. Oh, there's the spider, right? Um, so we'll talk about that because that's kind of like along with systematic desensitization, um, which is kind of a, a form of like exposure. But here is, um, here's Joan's study, right? This is from 1924 and um, what they did was, uh, <coughs> excuse me. You know, I was talking about little Albert. This individual has a fear of rabbits, right? And so in this particular case, what they did was the conditioned stimulus is the rabbit and the conditioned response is the fear of rabbits. And so what they would do is they would put um, Peter, um, that's this little guy's name right here. They would put Peter uh, in a relaxed state, right? They would give him a snack. Um, that's an unconditioned stimulus. You're eating cookies, drinking milk, you're, you're relaxed. Um, while in that state, they would now begin to introduce the rabbit, um, but they would do it in a way that was um, uh, little by little. So initially the rabbit's in a cage, and not very close. Uh, maybe uh, the next day um, they move the rabbit a little bit closer, right? Uh, maybe the next day they take the rabbit out of the cage, but still far enough away, right? So you're you're slowly adding um, the conditioned stimulus. You're linking it with the unconditioned stimulus, the relaxation plus the fear. Um, to produce a new response. And the idea here is, is that you cannot be uh, relaxed and afraid at the same time. Does that make sense? And so we're trying to, uh, uh, trying to have, use the relaxation for their benefit. Um, and that's also the idea, what I just said is also the idea behind systematic 
desensitization, right? Um, where a calm and pleasant state is gradually associated um, with in increasing levels of the anxiety inducing stimuli. So in this case, we're looking at the spider, right? So the idea that fear and relaxation are incompatible. So if the client can learn to relax around whatever it is that's scaring them, then eventually that uh, response will be eliminated. So going back to earlier, I used the term uh, trigger extinction. It's kind of the same thing there. After a while, the, the trigger becomes extinct. In other words, it's no longer associated with drug use in the example that I was using. And it's the same thing here that, that the uh, spider is no longer associated with the fear uh, because the person has learned to be um, um, relaxed around it. And then also uh, at the bottom of the slide, you will also see virtual reality exposure therapy. Um, this has been used for things like fear of flying. Um, I had also actually considered uh, using this with, with, uh, with one of my clients that had a, a really bad car accident that I had done some EMDR work with. Um, this was one of the things that I considered using VR and driving um, as a way to uh, uh, help conquer, you know, help him to, to uh, get over that fear of, um, of driving. Uh, so virtual reality uh, is another, another way of using this. And I'm also getting a my internet connection is unstable. So if I, well, you know what? It's, um, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and take a break. It is almost, well, it's 7.07. I'm just gonna round it up to 7.10. Let's uh, come back at uh, 7.30, 23 minute break. And, um, and we'll pick up on behavior therapy when we return. So everyone enjoy your break. All right, welcome back from break. Um, so where we left off, we were about to start talking about behavior therapy. Um, and here we're coming back into um, operant conditioning, uh, which was also part of the learning chapter. So here we are hitting it again. Um, and the idea behind operant conditioning is if we're not reinforcing a behavior, guess what? It gets extinguished. In other words, it goes away. Um, so <clears throat> this is often used in helping um, children with autism if they're on the spectrum. Um, and specific reinforcers can be used like praise, candy um, as a reward. And, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. And what this does is this help, helps uh, um, the children to uh, be motivated to display um, the desired behaviors. Right, so that's what they're doing. Uh, and then punishments, um, for example, timeout might be used to discourage unwanted behaviors, right? So we're talking about uh, positive reinforcement um, and um, positive punishment or negative punishment, right? Uh, and then there's also the token economy. And oftentimes this is actually used in controlled settings um, uh, such as psychiatric hospitals. Um, and they receive uh, you know, the tokens um, in return for desired behaviors that then later they can trade in for either specific items or uh, privileges. We're gonna see a short video on token economy now. So let me get that set up. A key idea to many behavioral therapies is the use of reinforcement to shape and change behavior. However, other techniques are used, such as extinction. And this was used in the study I just talked about with the psychiatric nurse as a behavioral engineer. They used extinction to decrease symptoms of schizophrenia. But let's look at a different type of therapy that's used as reinforcement. One successful ABA technique that is used by behavioral therapists is a token economy. And here, desired behaviors are reinforced with a token. That can be something like a sticker, a star on the board, or some type of chip. 
These tokens are accumulated and can later be exchanged for other items or privileges. For example, a child with ADHD may be put on a token economy wherein he gets a token for every homework assignment that he completes on time. After he accumulates five stars, he gets 10 extra minutes of recess. Moreover, if he earns 10 stars, he gets to go on the field trip with the class. The token economy technique has been found to be especially effective in treating drug addiction. So let's look at an example of that. Stephen Higgins and his colleagues conducted a series of studies where they gave cocaine-dependent participants tokens for each drug-free urine sample that they provided. In some of the studies, the value of the tokens increased for each consecutive drug-free sample. So for example, perhaps the first token was worth 25 cents. If they provided a drug-free urine on the next day, it would be increased to 50 cents. On the third day, if they provided a drug-free sample, it would go to 75 cents. Now remember, these were just tokens. They didn't earn actual money. And part of this was because they wanted to make sure that the tokens could be exchanged for appropriate items, meaning they didn't want to give these individuals money and then perhaps risk them taking that money and going out and buying drugs. So again, if drugs were found in the urine, the value of the token decreased to the original starting value. So again, if they had consecutive drug-free urines, the token value increased each time. But if drugs were found in the urine, it went back to the original starting value. In these studies, the researchers found a significant decrease in drug using, especially compared to other therapies such as Narcotics Anonymous. These individuals spent longer time drug-free than individuals in those other treatments. Given the success of these types of studies, this behavioral approach has been listed by the National Institute on Drug Abuse as the best option for drug addiction, along with medication. All right, hold on one second. All right, let's see here, something in the chat. Uh... Vanessa, see me after class. And we'll take care of that. Uh, let's see. I took roll um, while you guys were on break. So I might have accidentally marked someone incorrect. But since I'm in the middle of lecture, can't deal with that at the moment. So um, any questions on roll, just see me after class. All right. So the next section is uh, cognitive therapy, right? And so this is. Um, how, uh, um, how we think, right? And this was developed by Aaron Beck uh, in the 1960s. And the basics behind it, I, and actually you've heard me talk about cognitive therapy, cognitive behavior therapy throughout uh, the semester. I usually will bring that up. Um, I use it a lot. Um, but basically it's how you think determines how you feel and how you think and feel determines how you act, right? And so cognitive therapy is basically focusing on the thoughts, on how these thoughts lead to feelings of distress, right? And there's a couple of ways that, that I will actually use this, um, you know, in, in, in my own work with clients. Um, <coughs> so emotional reactions are really the result of your thoughts about a situation rather than the situation itself. And so one of the techniques, I don't think I have it on here, but it's known as the ABCD method from rational emotive behavior therapy. And basically what it is, is there's an activating event, something happens, right? So there's something happens. Um, let me think of an example. Oh, here's an example. So imagine walking down the hall one day and you pass somebody that you talk to a lot, maybe he's in one of your classes and you say hello to that person, that person is looking at you and they walk right by you, don't even acknowledge you, right? So that's the activating event. And a person's thought about that, right? What's, what's their belief about that situation? Uh, they, they might go, oh, that person doesn't like me, or maybe I, you know, what did I do, right? Um, uh, may, maybe they feel rejected in that moment, right? Um, oh, you know, they don't like me, uh, I'm not lovable, whatever the case may be. 
And that results in, in a feeling. There's like an emotional consequence to that, right? Um, and that consequence is they might feel sad. They might feel mad, right? Um, and that, that thought and that feeling leads to some type of behavior. Um, the behavior can be as simple as maybe I'm not going to talk to that person, right? Not engaging, withdrawing is a form of behavior. Um, maybe the behavior is, is, hey, how dare you? That was very rude of you, right? So that might be a behavior that happens. Um, but the idea behind cognitive therapy is is to help clients become uh, better at interpreting the situation more logically, right? Maybe thinking it of, of other reasons why that might have happened. So going back to that activating event, let me ask you this, or just think about this. Have you ever walked by someone, they've said hi to you, but your mind is on something else? You might even be looking at them, but you're not really seeing them, are you, right? And then as they go by, you go, oh, wait, so-and-so just said hi to me, but it's too late. They're already gone, right? Um, it's like one of those wait what moments. Um, so if, if in that situation, you were able to dispute your initial thought of, oh, I'm not liked, or that person's being rude to me, and it makes me angry. If you're able to dispute that thought with, well, you know, maybe they had something on their mind. Um, uh, maybe they didn't see me just because they were looking at in my direction doesn't mean they were looking directly at me, right? So having, having a different way of interpreting the situation, now instead of being angry or mad and acting out in a way, um, you might be going, oh, you know what? I've done that before. And you might end up not being mad, not being sad, right? Um, which means you're probably going to act better, right? Um, the other thing about thinking is oftentimes we will look at, um, you know, we, we talked about cognitive distortions um, in a previous chapter. Uh, some of these are like um, overgeneralizing, polarized thinking, uh, jumping to conclusions are the, the examples that I, that I posted here. And what we try to do with cognitive therapy is have them looking, look at that. So if somebody is always thinking either it's all good or it's all bad, right? There's a lot of gray that is being, um, a lot of things in the middle that are being missed. And so cognitive therapists will try to help clients to become aware of those, those distortions or what's also known as unhelpful thinking styles um, in order to change those thinking patterns so that they're not they're not using them in an irrational or illogical way anymore, right? Um, trying to correct them so that they uh, um, have more logical um, belief system um, or thoughts, which in tune is going to impact the way they feel. So, um, so that's, how, that's how that works. And that's often what we use. And there's different techniques for doing that. Another one that I like to use is, uh, for CBT is known as um, uh, down arrow. Um, when you know, we, we try to get to, uh, to the bottom of a particular belief or thought system. So here's an example. Um, so if, you, if a person consistently interprets events and emotions around them uh, with themes of loss and defeat, then, they, then that person is actually going to be more depressed, right? Everything is being about defeated. So for example, let's look at the top, um, let's look at the top part of the um, diagram here, right? So you fail a test. You're, so that's the activating event, right? So that's what happened. The internal belief, in other words, what it is that, that I'm thinking is I'm worthless, I'm stupid, I can't do this. Um, and then the resulting emotional or affective state is going to be, I'm depressed. Um, if we're able to change that irrational, right? Failing one test does not mean that a person is completely worthless, does it? Or that they're stupid, 
that that's just that's an irrational belief it's totally black or white um, a complete failure uh, because you failed one test um, but if we can change that around so an individual fails a test um, their internal beliefs might be i'm smart but i didn't study for this test i can do better in other words, that failed test is not defining the individual as being stupid or worthless anymore. Um, and the result of that is there's not a negative affective state. Um, that individual is not experiencing depression uh, because their, their belief system is, is, is more rational. Um, there was also another video on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. I've already been kind of talking about, I kind of introduced rational emotive therapy. Um, I, you know, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. You know, cognitive therapy focuses mainly on thoughts. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy then moves on to um, thoughts um, and, and your behavior. Um, but they are all very close cousins of each other, right? Um, they're siblings. Uh, so cognitive therapy, rational emotive therapy, um, also known as uh, REBT, rational emotive behavior therapy, um, and then cognitive behavioral therapy. They all start off with the cognitions um, and then focus on emotions and behaviors. So um, that's where I was using, and you'll see this example at the bottom using the ABC model that I was demonstrating. If we go back here, that's, that's what I did uh, when I was using this example, right? So this is the A, the activating event. This is the B, um, the belief about the event. And then this is the C, what's the emotional consequence? I kind of wanted to uh, highlight that again. And so that's what we're talking about here with cognitive behavioral therapy. The other idea behind this also, with, uh, especially with CBT, if I can affect one area, then it can have an impact on the other two. So if I can, if I can affect the way I think about a situation, it's going to change the way I feel and behave as a result of that. If I change the way I feel about a situation, I can change the way I think and behave. Um, so sometimes I will actually, when I'm working with clients and I'm explaining this process, I will use a uh, you know, picture a triangle in your head. The top of it is thinking, the bottom um, uh, left is feeling, and the bottom right is behavior. And if I target any one of those points on the triangle, I can affect the other two. Um, I don't know why I didn't think about putting that diagram on here because it's easier to demonstrate, um, but I just thought about that now. Um, any questions on that? Hopefully I didn't get too jumpy and I totally made sense. And if not- That is not gonna be on the test, right? Professor? What's, it, what, what's not gonna be on the test? The cognitive behavioral therapy or yes? Yes, it will be, yeah. Yeah, there no, will be- just, No, I thought there's not gonna be, sorry. No, no, it's the, this video is not available. Um, so I'm not going to test you on anything in the video, but really what's in the video is what was in the video is kind of like what I'm talking about here. Okay. Right? Yes. Right? And so if you remember that the way you think affects the way you feel and the way you think and feel affects the way you behave, you're going to have the basis for cognitive behavioral therapy. If you, um, if you're looking at just cognitive therapy where they're just changing the way you're thinking targeting those um, uh, irrational beliefs or those cognitive distortions. Um, and another way of saying cognitive distortions is unhelpful thinking styles, then, then you're gonna be on the right track with, with all of these. And they're all very closely, closely related. All right. Um, any other questions on CBT? All right. So the next part of um, therapy is known as humanistic therapy. And we've talked about humanistic approaches uh, before as well. 
And Carl Rogers, he's really the, um, he's the father of humanistic um, client-centered therapy. Uh, you will, if you ever hear the term Rogerian, um, they're talking about Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers was really, he, he was very um, uh, non-directive. Uh, it, it takes a very non-directive approach. Um, he believed in um, uh, unconditional positive regard. Uh, this should not be a new concept. We've talked about it, I think, twice before in this semester, certainly in the first, in the first chapter, we talked about it. So unconditional re positive regard means that the therapist, the counselor does not judge the clients um, at all in any respect, does not judge them for who they are um, and simply accepts them for who they are. Um, he also believes that the, that, uh, that the client is the, you know, they're the expert in their life um, and that, that we're just a vehicle for helping them meet their goals. And we do this with active listening. We do this by showing um, uh, genuineness, authenticity, empathy. Um, and, and this is designed to help the clients accept themselves as to who they are as well. Let's see, I think I said this already, but um, it is non-directive. Uh, we're not giving advice. Um, we're, we're allowing the, the, the client to come up with their, own, um, with their own goals and their own methods of achieving those goals. So it's very, very, very non-directive. And so here is um, Carl Rogers. And uh, he's going to present it in his own words here. Part of it. I am very fortunate, and the client is very fortunate. If I can feel I really accept you fully just as you are. Uh, sometimes that's very difficult. I held an interview with a uh, young man in South Africa. I didn't know anything about him. It turned out he was an officer uh, in the South African Army. Now, for me, that meant a real, it meant that I stretched my empathic abilities to their very limit mm. to try to be with him, to try to understand him, to try to be caring toward him. Mm. Uh, I didn't feel I did too well. And yet, uh, I've learned since that interview really changed the course of his life. Um, so I feel that if I can be genuinely understanding, try to uh, listen not only to the words, but to the meaning, trying to understand the person that's hidden within each one of us, uh, that's helpful. If I really care about this person uh, in an unconditional way, that's helpful. If I can really be myself in the relationship, not not a professional expert, not a, quote, psychologist, not a psychotherapist, just me in that relationship, that's helpful. Uh, all those things are possible, and when they come together, that creates a very powerful climate for change, for, for growth, uh, for drawing out the potential of the, of the client. All right. So one of the things I kind of want to point out, what he said there, right? Um, he was talking about unconditional positive regard. Uh, and he also talked about how sometimes that can be uh, difficult, right? Um, uh, you know, he said, I stretched my uh, empathy, my skills to the limit. And he actually judged himself, if you paid attention there, he actually judged himself as not doing well in that interview. But then later on, uh, received some feedback um, about that, that very same individual that, that there had been change in that person's life. So um, I think that's the other thing that's kind of important to know. There have been times, me as, as, a, as a therapist and a counselor over the years, where I'm, I'm thinking, oh, this just is not going well, right? In my own mind, I'm like, I'm still doing the best that I can. We're still doing some interventions working with the client, 
Um, but in my mind, I'm thinking, hmm, I, I, I don't think I'm doing as well. I, I don't think this is working, right? Um, you know, and it, and it makes me want to try harder and do other things and, and experiment with things. But just because I'm thinking that, guess what? No one can read my mind. No one knows what I'm thinking. Uh, the client may or may not be thinking that. And oftentimes, you know what it turns out is they're actually, uh, they're not thinking that, <laughs> right? So sometimes um, we could be our own worst critic. And, and I point that out now um, because I know some of you are, 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 are in the AODS program. Some of you are um, uh, thinking about going on and doing social work and, and, and different things where we're going to be, where you're going to be interacting with clients. It is natural to kind of have those thoughts and doubts. Um, and this is where supervision comes in. This is where additional training comes in. So I always encourage people to do that. Um, but sometimes we can be our, our own worst, uh, our own worst critic. So if I was doing some cognitive, if I was going to cognitive therapy, um, the cognitive therapist might be working on my, um, on my thinking process, you know, in, in that particular situation. Was it really rational, right? Because uh, it was making me feel uncomfortable, as an example. I don't know if that was helpful at all. Um, uh, but I, I sometimes like to talk about that. All right, so let's talk about some biomedical therapies. Um, I kind of briefly touched on it uh, earlier. You know, there's uh, different medications. I mean, we can, I'm not gonna go through and, and, and read all of these. Some of these I've already talked about, like electroconvulsive therapy, um, uh, which, you know, is designed to induce seizures to help alleviate severe depression. And again, that's used as, as probably, uh, you know, um, an end course of treatment. It's not the first course of treatment. This is for uh, depression that's very difficult to, um, uh, to treat. Um, you know, there's uh, antipsychotics and these are designed to treat the positive symptoms. Um, and remember when, when you hear, because we, we kind of talked about uh, positive and negative symptoms in the last chapter. Remember, positive doesn't mean good and, and negative doesn't mean bad. Positive means adding or taking away. So for positive psychotic symptoms, um, it's hallucinations, delusions. These are, these are things that are being added to the, to the individual's experience, right? Um, and antipsychotics um, are used by blocking dopamine. And that's, that's how they work. Um, atypical antipsychotics treat the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, such as withdrawal or apathy, right? By targeting dopamine and serotonin. So the, the negative symptoms would be the, the person is like withdrawing from social interactions. Uh, negative symptom, negative emotional uh, symptoms would be, you know, just not, not being motivated, not being engaged, right? Um, so negative is symptoms that are, that, that are being taken, not taken away, but uh, symptoms that are showing withdrawal and apathy. I know it gets confusing, but think positive and negative is adding and taking away. The symptoms are being added or symptoms um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, uh, negative um, symptoms are things like withdrawal, like the person is, is, is withdrawing from, uh, from interactions. Um, antidepressants um, are designed to alter the levels of serotonin and norepinephrine. Um, remember, uh, like a lot of these would be like SSRIs, um, so which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So um, an SSRI would act as an agonist for serotonin by blocking reuptake, meaning that serotonin uh, in this example would be um, blocked from being taken back up into the neuron, meaning that it stays in the synaptic gap longer so that it can work more. So, you know, um, uh, and, and continue to, to um, activate the, the next neuron. 
So that's how that would work. Um, then you have anti-anxiety agents um, and they're designed to depress the central nervous system from activation. Because remember anxiety, what does it do? It, um, it activates the sympathetic nervous system, right? Gets us into that fight or flight mode. And so um, anti-anxiety agents are those that are designed to kind of depress activation of the nervous system. And then mood stabilizers that are used to treat mania um, as well as depression. And, and usually we're thinking of uh, uh, bipolar disorder, for example. And then there's uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And that's where they um, use magnetic fields to stimulate nerve cells to improve de depression symptoms. And actually, um, uh, this has been getting better and better over the years where they, um, they can actually target certain areas of the brain using uh, magnets um, being placed in different parts of, um, of a person's head. So some really interesting um, treatment there. All right. So now we're going to talk about like different treatment mode modalities. Um, you know, some of these treatment modalities that we've already been talking about, like psychoanalysis, remember the Freud and his couch? Um, that was an individual type of uh, treatment, right? <coughs> so a couple of things that I do want to talk about when it comes to treatment, whether a person's doing individual treatment, they're doing a residential treatment, they're doing group, group treatment. Um, you know, before a person really comes into treatment, there's, there's a screening process, is, is this person appropriate, et cetera. Um, but when they're actually going to start treatment, there's an initial meeting, um, and that is known as intake. Okay, so that is something you're going to want to remember. Um, so intake is where um, uh, information is gathered uh, to address whatever it is that the client's needs specifically um, are at that moment, right? Um, they're going to talk about the presenting problem. What's the client support system? Um, you know, what other needs do they need? Is there any community services they need linkage to? What's their ins insurance status? Um, and so yes, we do kind of have to talk about how services are going to be paid for, uh, whether it's you know through insurance, sliding scale, cash payment, whatever whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I. In here in California with Medi-Cal, you know, uh, most of my clients, you know, they uh, qualify based on their income for, for Medi-Cal and, and their services are paid through, um, through drug Medi-Cal. Uh, if they don't have that, then we have a sliding scale where it's like $20 a week, um, which roughly is $80 a month, right? Well, not roughly, it is $80 a month. So um, the other thing that's done during intake is the therapist should be talking about confidentiality, um, what, what fees there that could be in, in, incurred if they don't have insurance, for example. Um, that's where I might talk about the sliding scale or cash payments, insurance, what's covered, what's not, and then what to expect in treatment. So in other words, what kind of therapist are you? Are you a CBT therapist? Do you do EMDR work, right? What, what, is, what can the client expect? And then the other thing about treatment in general is the idea of confidentiality. Now, I'm sure everyone here has like heard of HIPAA, um, HIPAA privacy, um, uh, and that, that talks about confidentiality. So in other words, that, the, that your doctor cannot release your medical information, right? And I'm just using that as an example. Um, when it comes to confidentiality laws with therapy um, and also with um, substance uh, use disorder treatment, um, laws can be very, actually substance use disorder treatment has the strictest confidentiality laws. It's even stricter than HIPAA. Um, a person seeking substance use um, treatment um, the minute they apply, the minute they pick up the phone 
and that phone is answered on the other end and they give their name, say I'm interested in treatment, confidentiality automatically applies. Like I can never reveal uh, anyone that I've ever screened, even if they are never taken into our program. The mere fact that they applied for a treatment program means that, that they have, uh, that I have to keep that confidential. Um, so, and that's a federal law that's even stricter than HIPAA, um, which is also a federal law. Um, let's see. Uh, and then also treatment goals um, are discussed and treatment planning is, is discussions occur. Um, a treatment plan, it says it's formed that may or may not happen during intake. That actually might happen uh, a little bit later on, maybe the next day in another meeting. Um, it could happen in intake, but uh, I, I personally have never done that. And none of the programs I've ever worked at have, has, has done that. Um, but treatment planning occurs very close to intake, right? So they come in, they talk about their goals. Okay, let's do a, let's, let's figure out how we're going to meet your goals. Um, so as you see here in the pictures, you can have individual one-on-one -on -one treatment, or there's a picture of, um, of our Marines, again, uh, on the beach after surfing, and they're in a group. Um, and that's a pretty large group there. Oftentimes, group settings um, may, can be that large. Um, most of my groups that I do have anywhere between three and six people in them. Um, groups can be as large as 12. Um, and uh, so that's why I want to talk about next, right? So let's talk about group therapy. Um, group therapy is actually, it's, it's very common, especially in, with substance use disorders. Um, and some things that that I really like about group um, that work really well is that it can help decrease shame and isolation. Um, it it uh, lets people know that I'm not the only one that feels that way. Um, so that's the upside of it. The downside of it, sometimes clients will have um, uh, trust issues, right? They, they uh, may not be comfortable sharing with strangers. Um, so, uh, so sometimes a, a person coming into group, it may take them a little while to open up, but that's also part of the process, to be honest with you. Um, learning new communication skills, building trust within, within that group environment, um, taking little risks, uh, within the group environment can help them develop some, uh, self-efficacy, um, with that. And then there's also uh, psychoeducational groups. Um, and that's where um, there may be some processing that happens, but there's a strong educational component. They might teach some uh, relapse prevention skills or strategies. Uh, uh, they might talk about um, how drugs affect the body, for example. Um, you know, so there's a strong educational component to it. Uh, a lot of my groups that I do are either processed, there's some psychoeducational components to it, um, but I like to do a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, I like to do a lot of process with the clients. So, um, can't remember if I said this before, I might be repeating myself, but group therapy is, uh, is pretty common. Um, uh, most like uh, substance use treatment programs do uh, use group. It's also cost effective. Uh, you can treat a lot of a lot of clients, um, uh, so it's beneficial to the clients. It's also cost effective to to those um, doing the the group. Um, and not only is it good for substance use, but it's um, anger management is another place where there's uh, uh, a lot of group therapy that's done, and also psychoeducational groups in that eating disorders, uh, grief groups, things like that.
And then continue on with uh, treatment mod modalities. Then there's family therapy and couples therapy. Um, and so with family therapy, that, that's, that's aimed to enhance the growth of each family member as well as the family as a whole, right? So there's, you know, it, it addresses the family dynamic. Um, and so there's like the systems approach. Uh, and this is where the family is viewed as an organized system. Each member has, um, has their own part in creating and maintaining the processes that happen within the system. And those systems shape behavior. So each member uh, influences and is influenced by the other members. Um, so one example of that, so uh, one member usually has a problem in the family. And so we're gonna use the example of alcohol dependence here. Uh, and the therapist is, uses the systems approach to help them all cope with the issue. Um, and that can be an interesting dynamic. Um, sometimes the, the, the individual with the substance use uh, concern um, or symptoms, uh, that might be the identified patient. Um, and, and the family system is kind of developed all around, all around that one issue. Um, Let's see, so structural family therapy examines and discusses the boundaries and structure of the family. Um, and that's designed also to help resolve issues, um, teach effective communication. This is where um, also, uh, if you've ever heard of like speaker listener technique, this, this might be some practices that you might see in uh, not only in family therapy, but also in couples therapy as well. Um, uh, and then there's strategic family therapy, and that's uh, and the word strategic because it's usually identifying specific problems, um, and it's usually short term. Like this is this is the problem we want to focus on, um, so they strategically uh, address that one issue. And then in couples therapy, uh, it's just a couple, um, and it's designed to help them work on difficulties that they're experiencing within their relationship, um, learn communication skills, boundary setting, um, for example, how to listen, how to argue, how to express feelings. And this is where I was talking about speaker listener technique. Um, so the uh, rules of speaker listener technique uh, is that you know, whoever uh, is speaking has the floor. Um, and then the person who's listening can't interrupt, can't defend, uh, they just have to listen to what the person is saying. It's best worked, um, it's most ideal, and it works best when, uh, when you're not doing a long dialogue, right? Because in speaker-listener technique, you kind of want to um, say a couple of sentences, then the listener at this point will respond to that. Okay, what I hear you saying is, is this, and um, this is how you're feeling. And then that gives the speaker a chance to go, yes, exactly, that's how I'm feeling. And this is what else I wanna to add to that. Or it also gives them the opportunity to say, no, that's not what I meant. And it gives them an opportunity to rephrase. Um, but this really helps when, uh, to teach that new communication style so that, believe it or not, people learn how to argue better, if that makes sense. Um, uh, not get so emotionally involved, staying in the present, in the here and now, not bringing up the past, uh, and learning how to listen to your, your partner. Um, this technique also in couples therapy, they also use a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy as well. So addressing those thoughts, those feelings, and then the behavior that happens as a result. And then moving on to um, SUDs. So, you know, here's, here's the thing with um, substance use disorders. Early on, a minute, well, not early on, uh, about two or three slides ago when I was talking about confidentiality. Um, actually, I was just reading an article today on research uh, regarding stigma and um, people with uh, opioid use disorders actually seeking treatment and getting 
help using medication. I think uh, I was reading the article, I think it said like 18% of individuals that experience an opioid use disorder, an OUD, um, actually go on to get treatment and help and actually use medication to assist with that. Part of that is due to stigma. Now that's what the article was about to the, that I was reading today. And here's, here's why I'm talking about stigma in the moment. So if you look at the very top of this slide, initially individuals uh, voluntarily choose to use a substance. There, there's no question. The first time a person picks up a drink or a drug, it's voluntary. They're not under the influence. They're, ma uh, you know, they're, they're making a decision to do this, right? And this is where the stigma comes in. Because oftentimes uh, people with addiction that experience addiction are often judged to have, be morally deficient. There's, uh, you know, th that they're deviant in some way. Um, and we're finding that today, that's the other thing the article was talking about is how society is viewing addiction. Even with the prevalence of all the opioid use um, and uh, overdose and stuff that's happening, there's still a very negative view of addiction. Uh, and the idea is, is because, well, you chose to pick up that drug. Yes, absolutely. Here's what I'll say about this. In the human experience, it is very natural and normal for us to want to alter our um, perception. Um, so the person that goes home at night has a glass of wine, maybe once or twice a week, you know, they're choosing to do that. And, um, and that's a very natural, normal thing to do. So individuals are going to experiment. Here's where addiction becomes the problem um, and where stigma can, can be hurtful. After a while of chronically using a substance that actually changes your neural structure. It changes what's going on in your brain. And that also uh, impairs your judgment, impairs your decision-making. So whereas in the very beginning, yes, it was voluntary, after a while, um, it is no longer voluntary. Um, it is more compulsive and um, uh, judgment is impaired, decision-making is impaired, um, and the person becomes driven to use drugs or alcohol and it makes it very, very difficult to stop. Um, when it comes to relapse, and I wanna highlight this number because you know, I've, been, I've been working in the field for a very long time. And if you ask a lot of people, they will say, oh, 90 to 95% of people relapse, um, experience a relapse. And um, you know, the studies don't really bear that out. Um, but here's the other thing, we have to know what the operational definition of relapse is. So for those individuals, and when I'm teaching um, um, in the AODS program, a, a lot of uh, those individuals may have lived experience, maybe they're in recovery themselves, um, and they go to like AA meetings and NA meetings, any use is considered a relapse in the 12-step world. Um, but clinically, that may or may not be true. I'll give me an example. So somebody comes into the rooms and, um, and they announce themselves as a chronic relapser because they are picking up a 30-day a token or a 24-hour token every week, right? Every week they're coming in and yeah I, yeah, I relapsed again. Yeah, I relapsed again. Yeah, I relapsed again. Technically, that's not a relapse. And the reason why that's not a relapse is because they never stopped. That's called continued use, right? So it's chronic use. Um, so uh, the reason why I'm kind of going off on that is you will often hear very high rates of relapse. I think it's important to understand what is being called a relapse and whether or not it actually is a relapse or not. So for those that have actually come in and made some changes, progressed through the stages of change, if you'll recall the stages of change we talked about in the first chapter, um, you know, a person gets up to, you know, action stage of change, maintenance stage of change, 
uh, and then they have a recurrence of substance use. Um, maybe it's one time and they come right back. Um, that's, that is not a relapse. That's a recurrence, um, but it didn't lead to relapse. Yes, they used, they might've learned something from it, um, but they're right back, uh, they're right back to where, where they were in their stages of changes. They're like, oh no, I don't wanna do that anymore. A person that has gone through the stages of change, maybe they've gone through preparation, they're in action or maintenance, and they have a recurrence, but they don't return, and they continue to use, that would be a full-fledged relapse. So it's really important to distinguish between lapse, you know, recurrence or lapse, and actual relapse. So approximately 40 to 60% of individuals experience a relapse. Um, there might be a higher percentage that experience a recurrence, I will grant you that. Um, but we're talking about full relapse, returning back to the old behavior that they changed for an extended period of time. The other thing about um, substance use is the comorbid disorders that we had talked about before. And remember, comorbidity means that there are two things happening at the same time. So, um, and I really need to change this slide because substance abusers, it's a poor choice of words. Um, people who are experiencing substance use disorder symptoms are twice as likely to have either a mood or anxiety disorder. And we kind of talked about that in the last chapter and it's being brought up here again. Um, individuals that experience psychiatric um, symptoms may self-medicate um, and use substances in order to alleviate their, uh, their symptoms. Um, and these can be categorized as mentally ill and chemically uh, addicted. I really don't think we're using that term anymore. Um, I just kind of want you guys to, uh, to stick with, you know, comorbid disorders. Um, uh, the old term is like dual diagnosis um, or co-occurring. Um, so you'll hear any of those terms and they're all really talking about the same thing. And, um, and the other thing with these situations is they are often chronic. So the, the definition of addiction is that it is a chronic and progressive relapsing um, recurring uh, uh, situation, right? So relapse can be a part of, of that process. Uh, so when it comes to substance-related treatment, um, I've, you know, I've been using a lot of my own examples throughout this lecture uh, uh, anyway, but we're going to get a little bit more specific here. One of the things I will say about um, substance-related treatment is um, one, of the, one of the things that's important to consider is duration of treatment, right? And so what it says here is requires long-term treatment. Um, but on average, it takes a minimum of 90 days uh, for, of, of treatment for there to be some effective changes that begin to uh, occur. So think about that 90-day 90, uh, 90 um, time frame. Um, oftentimes, some clients will need more treatment than that. They will need you know, a longer time. Uh, a, a lot of the clients that I work with, our, our program is a minimum of 18 months uh, long. Um, and I say minimum because they can be in the program longer and they might uh, experience three different levels of care, residential, intensive, outpatient, and outpatient. Uh, those are three different levels of care. And all of those have their own timeframes. Um, so most of my clients, the they, their situation has been so chronic, has been chronic for so long, and their substance use disorder severe, so severe, that they need longer treatment. A person that's experiencing a mild substance use disorder uh, is not going to need as much treatment as an individual who is um, experiencing a severe uh, substance use disorder. And there are different interventions that would be used. Um, the other thing about uh, substance 
related treatment is that it is more cost effective um, than incarcerating, locking people up. Um, I think for every, the research shows uh, for specifically for drug court, um, for every dollar spent on treatment for um, a client, another $27 is saved, you know, um, in the uh, state, federal, community level. Um, and those dollars come from all kinds of different things from, you know, actual incarceration itself to other um, crime, other things that happens. So it can be very cost effective. Um, behavior therapy is often used um, uh, with uh, treatment. So I always, so I look at drug court as a, we use a couple of different things, right? We use behavior therapy, we use operant conditioning, we use uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, we use sanctions uh, um, as um, positive punishment, kudos as positive, uh, positive reinforcement, right? So uh, in, in, in the particular area that I'm working at, we're using all of those things. Um, we also encourage a medically assisted treatment. So getting people like, uh, for instance, on Vivitrol or the Sublocade um, shots. And then um, what makes treatment effective? I actually talked about this on the last slide. Um, I want you to think 90 days or three months um, is usually needed to begin to achieve some type of positive outcome. So, you know, you'll hear people talk about like the 28 day programs. You know, I'll be honest, 28 days is exactly four weeks. Um, and that's really, that has been kind of like insurance directed like who's paying for it. Um, and for a person that might have a, a, a mild substance use disorder, 28 days might, might be an early enough intervention that, that that is effective. But for, for people that are more chronic, um, usually it's three months or more. The other thing is holistic treatment. So uh, I cannot remember if I talked about the ASAM criteria in this class. I usually don't um, before now, so I don't think that I have. But ASAM is the American Society for Addiction Medicine. And what ASAM criteria is, is it looks at six dimensions of a person's life. And the reason why I'm bringing that up now is because under duration of treatment, you'll see the term holistic. And so when it comes to holistic treatment, that's where we're addressing multiple needs for the individual, not just their drug addiction, right? Not, not just that, but what are some behavioral, social aspects, physiological aspects, psychological aspects. So the ASAM criteria looks at six dimensions. It looks at, first of all, where they are right now, are they acutely intoxicated or do they need withdrawal? So in other words, we need to get them safe and and, and, and um, working on that. Um, but it also looks at their physical health. That's dimension two. Dimension three is emotional, behavioral, or cognitive conditions that may be affecting an individual. Dimension four is what is their stage of change? What is their motivation, right? And we need to know that in order, you have to match the uh, appropriate intervention to the um, appropriate stage of change. Otherwise, it's gonna be a mismatch and it's not gonna work. Um, dimension five of ASAM criteria is um, what is the risk factors for them to continuing to use the substance or what is their risk factor for relapse? And then finally, dimension six is looking at their recovery environment. Where are they living? What's their schooling like? Um, what's, what's their employment? Um, what's their social support? So we, look, we take a holistic approach um, to our clients. We look at all of these areas. Um, and when it comes to treatment planning, all of these areas get addressed, right? We send them to a doctor, you got to get a physical, right? Send them to the dentist, eye, um, vision, hearing. Um, we will um, get them connected with housing. Uh, if they don't have their GED, we link them up with uh, starting that process. They didn't complete high school. Um, we give them job um, assistance, uh, 
you know, so, so we're looking at all areas of a person's life. Uh, and then another thing that makes treatment effective, group therapy. Um, one of the, the researchers found that, um, and again, this is poorly worded, um, individuals that, that experience symptoms of addiction are more likely to maintain sobriety in a group format due to the therapeutic benefits, affiliation, identification, um, and believe it or not, even confrontation, right? So sometimes being called out on some of their behaviors by, not necessarily by the counselor, but by a fellow, uh, by a peer, they're more likely to hear it from a peer. Um, and then parental involvement if, uh, if we're talking about um, uh, adolescence. So in big bold print at the bottom, and I addressed this earlier when I was talking about um, uh, positive outcomes, the most important factor in a person's improvement in positive outcomes is the relationship or the rapport that is developed between the client and the counselor. Research has shown this over and over and over again. That is number one. What comes after that is maybe what interventions were used, but that, was, that has not shown to be the most important factor over and over and over again with research. So it's all about that rapport, the safety, the therapeutic alliance that is developed between um, the client and, uh, and the therapist or the counselor. So I kind of want you guys to remember that as well. All right, so then let's, uh, this is actually the last section. And so we'll probably be finishing here shortly. Um, but we wanna look at a social cultural model here too. And, and I talked about cultural competence earlier. Um, and, you know, and I talked about uh, the importance of having counselors understand and address issues of race, culture and ethnicity um, and to use strategies that address those needs of those various populations. Um, it is important to recognize where our clients are, are coming from, what their uh, cultural background is, um, how, how that impacts their, um, uh, how that impacts their recovery of whatever it is that they're looking at. Um, and then you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, um, and I've actually had this happen to me a couple of times, um, you know, um, over the years. And I'm thinking of one instance where I was talking with, uh, uh, with, a, young Latin, with a young Latina and she was like, you know, it, it, it's taken me a lot to come and do this because in my culture, we, we don't do this. We don't, we, don't, um, we don't go to mental health professionals. We don't talk about you know, our problems outside the family, um, you know, and, and so it's important to, to recognize those things, right? So, you know, another example is, you know, if I'm, if I'm working with, let's say I'm working with an individual of, um, you know, uh, of Japanese descent, and um, I'm working with this individual, and the individual does not make eye contact with me, looks down, bows, I, if I'm looking at it strictly from my Western uh, ethnocentric American point of view, um, I'm going to say, oh, the, you know, the client was made making avoidant co eye contact, wasn't really engaged, um, wasn't, um, wasn't actively listening. And I'm taking all of that based on the behavior that I'm seeing. And if I don't understand the cultural context of it, realizing that no, I'm a person in, in that, that, that this individual may view me as a person of authority. And by looking down, he's actually showing reverence to me and respect. If I'm misinterpreting that, I'm, I'm gonna get the whole situation wrong. Um, so cultural competency is really, really important. Um, you know, in the past I've, I've worked with um, individuals as, who will tell me, oh, well, you know, I don't see race, I'm completely colorblind. As a counselor, that is not helpful. That is, that is not a helpful attitude because you will become culturally blind. 
uh, and cultural blindness um, is not going to help your clients. Uh, that's why I was talking about earlier about, you know, uh, multi, uh, cultural competency is one of those um, continuing education things that I constantly have to do um, and that any all all counselors and therapists have to address that at some point each year uh, to make sure that we're staying on top of that. Um, but why is it important, right? So it, uh, it's important to integrate the impact of cultural and, so, and social norms into what's happening in therapy. Um, and it's designed to work with clients and define goals that's consistent with their life experiences and their cultural values, right? Remember, it's their treatment. Um, and then also it strives to recognize clients' um, identities to include individual, group, and universal dimensions, and then advocates the use of universal and cultural specific strategies and roles, right? What happens in the healing process? Uh, and also important to um, balance individualism versus collectivism in assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of clients. And if you'll recall, remember, um, and now it's gone out of my head, I forget which chapter it is, uh, social psychology chapter. We talked about individualistic uh, societies and collectivist uh, societies, if you guys will recall that. Um, and it's important to have that in mind when you're, when you're um, assessing, uh, assessing your clients. So going back to my example of the, of the Japanese client, right? Who was, you know, looking down, not making eye contact with me. Um, that's the other thing I have to realize too, is that that individual comes from a collectivist culture where the, where the belief is, is the uh, society as a whole, you know, contribution to society as a whole is more important than individual needs, basically, right? Um, whereas here in the United States, it's all about the individual. And if we're lucky, we contribute to society. All right, so here's some treatment barriers. Um, lack of insurance, transportation and time. I think those are kind of, you know, if you can't afford treatment, you're probably not gonna go to treatment. Uh, transportation is an issue. Um, I know uh, we've had this issue where, where I work, right? Um, getting to and from treatment. How, how does that happen? That can be a barrier. Person can spend hours on the bus just coming, you know, coming back and forth to treatment. Um, so that's the transportation issue and the time issue. Um, and what's interesting here, and, and research uh, studies have borne this out as well, is that even when access is comparable among racial and ethnic groups, uh, minorities tend to utilize uh, mental health services less than white middle-class Americans. Um, some other disparities to, to consider, um, bilingual treatment, or the lack thereof. Um, you know, living in Sa San Diego, um, uh, you know, by being bilingual, uh, or in some cases even trilingual, um, is can be a barrier. You have some, like I do not speak Spanish, for example. Um, so that's a barrier. Uh, fortunately, where I'm at, uh, about half the staff is bilingual. So, you know, we have people that speak Spanish, um, and for example. Um, and so that barrier can be overcome where I'm at because uh, a, a person that prefers to speak Spanish would probably be assigned to you know, a bilingual um, counselor and we have several to choose from. Stigma, I talked about stigma earlier. Um, and, and, and that's where people are, they fear being judged. Um, that's the other thing that the article that I was reading today talked about when it comes to stigma is not only are rates of low for um, opioid use disorder individuals and um, alcohol use disorder um, seeking treatment and getting medication from it, but in surveys, they have found that people are afraid to even get treatment because they don't know what their neighbors are going to think or say. 
Uh, so stigma is a big part of that. Fear of not being mis of of being understood, uh, of family privacy, um, lack of education on on mental illnesses or substance use disorders. Right. Um, the other thing about uh, that can be a barrier is an, an individual's own beliefs and attitudes around their self sufficiency. Like if I can't pull myself up by my own bootstraps then it's not worth doing. Um, here's the other thing, not seeing therapy as effective. So one of, the, one of the barriers that I've seen with some of the clients that I work with is um, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services uh, Administration. Uh, you know, they did a study, oh shoot, I forget how many years ago maybe 10 years ago, they did a study that showed that the average number of treatment episodes that a person experiences before finally getting recovery totaled around seven. Treatment episodes, that means a person goes to treatment um, and, you know, uh, and they have to do that seven times before they hit recovery. Here's the other thing to think about that. So they may come in and they may think, oh, this doesn't work. So in a treatment episode is also counted if they stayed one day, that's considered an episode. If they stayed 90 days and graduated, that's considered an episode. So the trouble with that, that particular research is de defining what an episode is. So it sounds like, oh, somebody went to treatment seven times. Well, it doesn't mean that they graduated or completed it all seven times. It just means they engaged in it. Right. So on average, seven engagements trying to stop. Um, the downside of that is sometimes those individuals that experience that might think, oh, I've tried this before. It didn't work. Um, and so it might block them from coming to it again. Um, concerns about confidentiality. Uh, earlier, I was talking about how strict uh, substance use disorder laws are. It's um, CFR 42 part two, it's uh, stricter than, um, than HIPAA. Uh, and I kind of described that earlier, even if a person just calls me up on the phone and says, hey, I'm interested, I want some information. Once that happens, the law says I can never release to a third party without that person's permission that they actually were seeking treatment. And the reason for that is because of stigma. And so this law came out, uh, came about in the 1970s, and it was designed to protect people um, so that they would seek substance use treatment because um, people weren't seeking it. And, and we still have those concerns today. And then the last thing is, is they, they may fear being hospitalized, right? Um, or they might be afraid of the treatment itself. Um, so that would be the individual's uh, perceptions and uh, attitudes that might be a barrier for treatment. And on that happy note, that is going to conclude the uh, lecture for this evening. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to stop the recording here in just a minute. Uh, and then we're going to don't go anywhere um, just yet. So I'm going to pause the recording. I'll end it.